So we're gonna we're gonna discuss now from the starting point we were holding basically up to the halacha bedikas chametz, and we'll go into bedikas chametz. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to get the waiting room off because a number of people are in the waiting room for some reason. Anybody know how we take off the waiting room here and let them admit them automatically? Sorry, I'm just going to try to figure out if I could. Does it sends everybody to the waiting room? Okay, I'm just going to have to admit them one by one during while we're talking. But anyways, so first thing we'll start with was there was one thing that we entirely did not cover in the in the last week, which is something that is going to be a very relevant topic to now, a very pertinent topic. And this is something that's much more relevant today, being that it's much more relevant today, being that the mikvahs are closed. And this starting point for this topic is essentially starts from what do we do in order to be able to use their utensils? Until now, we talked about searching the house. We talked about how to go through the kitchen and how to make the kitchen usable for Pesach. That was in the last session. And we still need to discuss what about using utensils? Because the utensils that were also used together with heat, the same way that the, the, the countertop could transfer the food taste or the food particles that are inside the counter through heat, it's the same thing when it comes to food that's inside the utensil will have the same problem that essentially anything that is, anything that it gets into it with heat is going to come out in the food that's being cooked or made afterwards. So one way to do it is that we take the, the utensil that we want to use that was originally used, either if it's a pot or a pan or anything else. And if this pot or a pan is, was used together with something that was chametz, so we could take it as long as it's something that's metal, something that we can, that we could possibly kosher it, we could put it into the, we could put it into the, the uh, hot water that was boiled on the stove. For instance, we take a pot, boil it up onto a full boil, and then we could put that, that smaller pan, that smaller pot inside of it. Or even if we want to use, usually we want to use our regular cup that we use for kiddush, we want to use it in Pesach also. So the truth is that really doesn't have to be kosher. It doesn't have to be the cleansed at all because anything that was used with cold and nothing potentially could get into it. So therefore you could just really clean it well, get all the little, you know, the little food particles from inside the, the, the design. And then we could just really use it. But the min hug, the tradition is, is that we try to kosher it. We try to put it in a normal circumstance as if we would have used it for something hot. And therefore we could do the same thing, boil up the pot, put up this, this utensil, this, this, this case, this cup that we use for kiddush inside of it. And then a, another condition before putting it in is not to use it 24 hours. Then we take it out, put it in a cold bucket of water, and that ends, ends the, the kashering process. Normally this was done. They're usually in most cities, they have places set up that they essentially kosher and they essentially make the, 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 either our pots or pans or anything we want to kosher for us. But this year, unfortunately, due to the virus, there really isn't gonna be much more congregating. And therefore, most people will probably be doing it at home if they want to do it this year. The simpler way that people generally do it, is there any questions on that aspect, on the, on the koshering part? Okay. Can't really, can't really see too many people, so yeah, just make sure everybody's there following, but. No, I'm doing my work tomorrow. No, you're not. Yeah. Yes, you are. You are not allowed. Okay. But anyways, so the kashering process, essentially, that's what we do. But the most simple thing is not to have to work with this kashering process. And most people, therefore, buy new pots, new pans, new plates, or anything else, essentially, that we'd be using for Pesach. 
But there's in this area, there's also one challenge that most recently came up. Because essentially, when we buy a new pot, a new pan, or something else from a non-Jew, and most things today, even if it's Judaica and it comes from Israel, unless it's something like a silver cup that comes from Hatzarfim or one of these other companies, and most, most of the Judaica, the classic, the things you buy in the stores are made in China, which essentially means they're owned by a non-Jew. And after they're owned by a non-Jew, they're given over to, we buy them, and we, they, are, they're, they're, they enter the ownership of a Jew. And the halacha is that when something goes from a possession of somebody who's not Jewish to the possession of somebody who is Jewish, being that now we're being using it for higher purposes, we're using it, for instance, for our Pesach Seder, we're using it for kosher, so therefore, we need to immerse it in water in order that the utensil should also go to this higher level of Kedusha by being used by a, by a Jew. And therefore, we put it into the, we put it into a mikvah and we say a blessing of al-tfilas kalim. Not all utensils need a blessing. This is only something that essentially needs to be, needs to be, for instance, metals, similar items to whatever we'll be able to do kashering on Pesach. These items need to be immersed and therefore we're gonna make the blessing on it. But this year we have a specific challenge because this year, we can't really use the standard kala mikvahs because the standard kala mikvahs, they're in, in areas where there would have to be public gatherings to get together. Also, different germs could transfer just through the use of the baskets. We're picking it up and down the, the area to open up the kala mikvah within the water itself, it could transfer. And therefore, I think pretty much in Toronto, all the kala mikvahs, they close and for good reason, especially since day by day, we see the worsening and the more unfortunate people that are, that are dying in our community in the, in the, in the Jewish from community, people are already passing away, unfortunately, from this, from this virus. And therefore, there's good reason to stay away from it. So what do we do? How do, what do we do about these new utensils that we bought? And essentially, these new utensils are going to be used for Pesach. What are we going to be used? What are we going to do in, in the placement of using a mikvah? So the truth is, is that this reality was the reality of our grandparents, great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents before they were standardized to really use a standardized mikvah. They didn't really necessarily have a mikvah that they used for utensils. And essentially, it doesn't need to be a mikvah that was made for utensils. Essentially, a lake could be used, a stream, a river. All these things could be used to immerse utensils inside them. However, there's conditions within this in itself. Because within this itself, to be able to use a lake and a river or a stream, not everything is able to be used for a mikvah in order to immerse the utensils. For instance, anything that's for, any body of water that's formed by rainwater has to be stationary. If it's not stationary, it's not a kosher mikvah for utensils, for people, or for anything else. And therefore, if you have a stream, that the stream is essentially only from rainwater, and it, when it doesn't rain in a while, then it kind of dries up. So that stream cannot be used for utensils. And the reason is, is because it's in rainwater, and unless it's stationary, unless the rainwater fell into a stationary area, it's not kosher for, for immersing kalim inside it, for immersing utensils that we bought inside of it. So therefore, being that it would not be kosher if, if, it's, if it's not stationary, so we're not gonna use that kind of stream. However, a lake can be used or any stream that comes from a natural underground sort of water, like an underground spring. So therefore, since that's the case, most of our rivers are assumed to have an underground water source, unless we know otherwise. And therefore, if it's a standard river that, that flows year round, we could assume that this river has an underground water source. The underground water source, a Mayan, is able to be used even if it's moving. And therefore, that can be used. If somebody has in front of their house a little bit, a, a, a small pond or something else like that, Generally, that comes from rainwater, and it would really depend whether or not the water is in movement. It moves from place to place. If it moves from place to place, 
then it would be a problem that it wouldn't be kosher mikvah because it's not stationary and it came from rainwater. If, for instance, it went through a filter when it went to fill it up, also that would be a problem because it entered a utensil before entering its final place, and that's something called anything in utensil before going to final place can also not be used. So essentially what can be used would be either a natural body of water that's flowing, that has a potential of an underground spring going into it, or something that was formed by rainwater, but that's essentially in compact in one place and it's not moving. This is not necessarily so accessible in all areas. And also many people are avoiding for good reason to go to places outside that aren't necessary. So in a case where it's not possible to go to one of these places in order to immerse the utensils, there's another idea that was proposed by many different, many different rabbis. And those ideas that were proposed, there were two ideas in as follows. And we'll mention what the problem is with those ideas and why they're only being used now because of necessity, but they're not normally going to be used. And one of these ideas is that maybe we should take this pot that we bought and sell it with our chametz to the non-Jew. And now it's still owned by a non-Jew. And if it's still owned by a non-Jew, we're allowed to use the utensil of a non-Jew as long as it's kosher. And we're allowed to still use this for our cooking. So maybe we should just sell it with our chametz. So there's two essential problems with that. One problem is, is that the Taz, in the laws of immersing utensils, the Taz points out that if we sell this utensil to a non-Jew, and therefore the non-Jew is now the owner, how are we allowed to use this without permission? And the Taz says, therefore, this is not the best idea. Besides that, if somebody is going to continue using this utensil after Pesach, then the, rab the rabbi is going to essentially bring the sale back. And now it's going to be owned by the person again, together with Fulas Hametz, because he's going to buy it back from the non-Jew for this person. And therefore, now he's back to the same problem. So there's another idea that was proposed that one can go have three people, that these three people are just random three people. He could call them up on the phone. They recognize his voice and they say, I am declaring this non-ownership. This does not belong to me anymore. This utensil that he's holding, this is not mine anymore. And therefore, once it doesn't belong to a Jew at this point, not only if it belongs to a non-Jew, but if it doesn't belong to a Jew, it also doesn't need to be able to be immersed. So being that's the case, he's able to use it on Pesach without needing to immerse it, without needing to do tefillah. This is also not so simple because many debate on whether or not it's possible to give up ownership on something. And then I'm using it every single day, using it uh, for my tea, using it for everything else. How could that be you gave up ownership if you're showing your owner by using it? So this is a little bit of a complex topic. However, there are many authorities that say that this can be done in a place where a person can't find a natural body of water, one that either comes from a spring and is flowing or a natural kind of body of water that is, for instance, Lake Ontario or any other kind of lake, or if it's just rainwater, but it's a stationary, if one can't find that, then they can rely on calling up three people and saying, I'm declaring this, describe to him exactly what it is that he's giving up ownership on. And at that point, he's able to use it for Pesach until the, until the ability comes up to be able to possibly use it again. Does anybody have any questions on this topic of Phyllis Kalem? If anybody has, either could unmute and say it, or we could put it in the chat. Or you could just write, we got it, and go farther. Does everybody hear me? Hmm. Does anybody just want to write in a thumbs up or anything just to make sure we're going at this? Dean? Okay, Dean, we got it. Okay, we got a thumbs up. So we're going to go to the next, the, the next topic. We just took care of what to do about our kalim, about our utensils. And are you going to mention other ways to use the utensils? Meaning... Meaning we're talking about if we 
if we if we caution them, if we we're talking about new uh, utensils. So co-ownership with a Gentile is essentially if it's sold to a Gentile. Once it's in partnership, that would be, and a person's using it for themselves, then they would have to likely immerse it. These are more complicated, but it definitely would not be simple to co-ownership. And also, why co-ownership when he could just sell it entirely to a non gen or he can possibly sell it to him or give it to him and, and not have ownership at all, and therefore you get all the, rid of all those problems. And the, and the problem of using his utensil, so the Maril, many others learned that it's not a problem, and it's less of a problem than a problem of being a co-ownership, because since he's an owner, he would still need to do tefillah on the time that he's using it, because there's different ways of co-ownership could work. Co-ownership could be 50-50. The most simple co-ownership is that everybody owns it at the time that they're using it. And therefore, at the time he's using it, he would still have to immerse the utensil. Uh, okay, we'll have to discuss this because we'll have to see how this works. There are other ways of also doing it when it says in Arab Shabbos to just in general say that we're giving it over to a non-Jew. Um, that that is really very not simple to use on a not only on a basis where there's no other ability for Arab Shabbos we can give it over can't make some pecker on Shabbos and we can't sell it to a non-Jew so therefore there's no there's no possibility of doing something more so we're stuck with that necessity but if there's any time that it's possible to do it some more stable way it's definitely better to do it more stable way. but if there's other if there's other opinions that there's other ways to do it and you could definitely take those that we're coming from a reliable source this is just different options that are possible and we could always look into exactly what they're saying. I'll definitely look into that. I wasn't aware that there was another an, uh, another um, good idea was being proposed. We'll definitely look into that. The next part we get into now is, now that we finished with preparing the house and preparing our utensils, so we're gonna move into the next stage, which was searching the night of the 14th, which this year is Tuesday night for Chametz. And essentially the night of the 14th, why are we searching? We just cleaned our entire house. So one of the reasons proposed that one of the reasons proposed for, for searching the Chametz on the night before, even though we cleaned our entire house, is because the Gemara says essentially specifically that we should search on the night of the 14th, Ar Haner, using candlelight. And the reason for this is then whenever we go into, if somebody goes into a, a, a theater a stage, they shut off all the lights and far beyond you see the stage lights and it becomes so much clearer to see. So when you have darkness around and it's nighttime, everything is dark and you shine the light in a certain area, it's much easier to really see if somebody missed something. And that's essentially what we want. So therefore, even though we searched our houses and even though we cleaned it very well, we still go through with a flashlight Really, the, the Talmud says to use a candle, or Moshe Feinstein says the idea is to have a single concentrated light, and therefore a flashlight is adequate. Some people, they like to have the candles and make the blessing with the candle, and then they put it out and then switch over to a flashlight. But either way, if the idea is to have that concentrated light to be able to search by. And Rup Shalem Zalman does point out that Nobody, a person doesn't have to search in every single nook and cranny since they essentially did clean in advance. The main idea is to go room by room to shine it in different areas that there might have been chametz possibly put into or chametz might have gone into it. And to just give a, a quick overlook, just to make sure that things were done right and there's no obvious chametz that's stick in these, stuck in these areas. And essentially we're searching the areas that chametz might have got into in our house, in our car, and all the areas where we likely would put into comments would possibly like or would get into there really more than just likely. So those areas will give it a, a quick overview to look in the different drawers and different places to check and to search whether or not comments is put into there. Another important place to check is pockets, pocketbooks. Those are very generally things that easily get missed over in the times of the cleaning because pockets were still wearing the jackets. And sometimes that's why there's a mitzvah. If a person lives in a place without an Erev, 
there's a mitzvah to check one's pockets on Erev Shabbos. And the reason is because there's always stuff stuck in our pockets. We're always sticking things in. And if it's a coat that we wear during the weekday and on Shabbos, very likely things are in there. So therefore, on Pesach also, that it's very likely that we have things stuck, you know, in one of our pockets somewhere. So one of the very important places to po check is the pockets of the coats, pocketbooks, or kids' knapsacks, unless they were gone through ahead of time, to go through them also at the time of the Vedikas Chametz. So what do we do if we, find, if we find Chametz? And the truth is, is that we start off and we make a blessing before we start this searching for the Chametz. And we make a blessing, Baruch HaTah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Elam, Al Bir Chametz. Why are we saying Al Bir Chametz? We're not destroying it. So the Rush says, because the beginning of destruction is to first find it in order to destroy it. I had a rabbi that used to say over, he said, what's the first step when you're trying to get from Chicago to New York? Anybody want to try? So the rabbi said, the first step is to know you're in Chicago. Because in order to do something, you have to know where you are. So essentially, the reason why we make the blessing of Albir Chametz is the first step to destroying the Chametz is to know that the Chametz is, to, to find it, so therefore we make that blessing. After we finish searching, we say kol chamira v'chamiyah, every single piece of unleavened bread that's in our property, we're giving up ownership, and it becomes like dust in the earth. So really, we don't need both expressions of giving up ownership and becoming like dust, dust in the earth. The reason why we say both expressions, there's a big debate. What does it mean when we say bittel, when we're, we're, we're getting rid of, what does it mean when we're saying this proclamation that we don't want this chametz. And it's a debate between Rashi and Tosfis. One says is that what we were supposed to do is we're supposed to give up ownership on it. And therefore, for that opinion, we say we're giving up ownership. There's another opinion that we're just supposed to say that it becomes worthless to me. Because essentially, it is worthless. We can't get any benefit from it. We can't eat it. It's just we run into a technical problem that the Torah said not to own it because even though it's not worth anything, but if we're owning it and we're showing that we're keeping possession, we're, we're showing that it is worth something. That as long as we're saying that it becomes to me like nothing, being that it's worth nothing because it can't be eaten and it can't get any benefit from it, so therefore it actually keeps its status of nothing. And being that's the case, so therefore we could just say it becomes like dirt of the earth and it becomes absolutely worthless for its intrinsic value and what it has to us. And therefore there won't be a problem if it ends up being in somebody's house Sorry, just admitting somebody else for some reason I have to do this. So being that essentially, sorry, just trying to admit somebody, but some, not letting it admit in. So essentially, since we're trying to let's see, okay. Sorry, I'm letting somebody else in. Okay. So since essentially we're, we're giving up the ownership of it and, and showing that it's worthless, so essentially it, it gets the place of, becomes not, not, either not ours, it becomes valueless. And therefore, even if we find that we end up having chametz and we gave up ownership, we don't have a prohibition of owning it because it's, it's absolutely worthless and it's not, and there's nothing to it. And therefore, we're not going to have a prohibition. But as soon as we find it, we'll go into the laws later of what essentially to what essentially to do with it. So that's basically the 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 laws of the of searching for chametz in the at the nighttime. Um, is there any any there specific question to... on the topic of searching for chametz? People, um, some people don't know how to turn their mic off. <laughs> And sometimes you hear the, you know, success. Sorry, I could probably do it. Okay. So there's another a topic also that we generally as a minute to do in the time of searching for chametz, being that we started off with the question of why are we searching for chametz if essentially we cleared the whole house? We, we gave up the idea of that a flashlight or a candle is like stage lights and it's a much better way to be able to view it. This book, Rabbi Shalom Zalman, that a person just has to basically make sure everything's in order. 
There's a meaning also, in order for it to not be a blessing for nothing, there's a meaning that many people have to take 10 pieces of, of bread, wrap them, you know, just so the crumbs don't get over a place and hide them in different places. Generally, one member of the household will hide them and then another member will search for them and they'll make the blessing of Albir Hametz. They'll search for this, they'll search for these, these 10 pieces and after finding them, they'll put them away on the side for tomorrow. What's tomorrow? So if we move now to the morning of Pesach, the morning of Pesach, so essentially a, a part of the morning we're able to continue eating chametz and generally whatever chametz at this point we're continuing to eat, we should put in a separate place that it shouldn't get mixed into the house that we already searched. Um, we can either just put a specific place or at this point, since the sale to the non-Jew didn't happen yet, we also that we decided to sell to the entire, to the non-Jew because there's chametz stored in there and we don't want to have to check it. So we can put the chametz in that, we can put the chametz in that place and putting the chametz in that place until the next day we're going to burn it. So if we move now a moment to the topic of the morning before they actually burning the chametz. The chametz that essentially at this point is still left over, either we're going to burn it the next morning or we're going to include it with the chametz that we're selling to a non-Jew. And these selling to a non-Jew generally, we appoint the rabbi to be our missionary. It's a little hard personally to go over to a non-Jew and explain what's going on and, and therefore to tell them, hey, you're going to buy this from me um, right now, you know, for this amount of money. And then after Passover, I'll buy it back. So usually the rabbis have it figured out. They have a non-Jew that understands what's going on and they do it in advance. And all we really need to do at this point is essentially just to call up the rabbi and ask him to be the missionary. This year, many years, there's a little bit of, of more that's happening, but this year there's no real personal contact that's happening. Most of it is working through just appointing him over the phone or by filling out the form, uh, forms and signing it. And then we're making him our legal missionary to sell. We're making our shliach to sell our chametz for us. And being that we made him a shliach to sell our chametz for us, now he could take care of it because he becomes our messenger. He's doing it for us. And therefore we can rely on him that it's going to be sold. And we could just really just put it in a cabinet, the, a closed cabinet or a closed room, mark the front of it to say sold. And the reason we have to put it in a closed door or closed room or cabinet is that the Talmud tells us that if we have the chametz of a non-Jew in our possession, it's okay to stay in our possession because it doesn't belong to us. However, how do we know, we talked about last time, maybe somebody's going to come to eat it, and especially we know we're going to buy it back after Pesach. And this non-Jew was never going to even know that we ate it on Pesach. So some well, essentially, it doesn't need to be a wall. It just has to be somewhere that we could tell that it's sold. So therefore, we can put it in a cabinet. And then essentially, we, we, we filled out the form, we called the rabbi, and therefore it's going to be a good sale. And as we mentioned, different years, we do it in person because generally we make somebody a messenger. But actually, usually there's some kind of, there's some kind of more ownership transactions going on, but that, can, that this year being that we're staying away from personal meetings, we're not going to do that. In general, it's over the internet or on the phone to just tell them to be the messenger. So we basically just covered this, the, the sale to non-Jew and marking the cabinets. We covered the idea of preparing our, our utensils a little bit earlier. And about, in, in, about today, we, could, uh, we covered the idea of searching for the chametz. And we're holding by the morning now, the morning of the 14th. In the morning of the 14th, we start off the morning, probably doing the last preparations, or we start off the morning essentially. There's still the ability early in the morning if we want to put aside together with the chametz we're going to burn and maybe a roll or something else and eat it. So that's possible. And I see over here we have a schedule that it says it's according to the schedule they have marked the last time to eat chametz in Toronto. This is in Toronto, Ontario, is 10:38, which means that until 10:38 we're allowed to eat the chametz, and after that it becomes not permissible to eat anymore. 
this is the last time and this is a rabbinical um, decree not to get too close to the idea that it becomes a real serious problem to eat the chametz. And from 1038 to 1159, almost 12 o'clock, but 1159, actually it's better that way because we had a Dale Carnegie course with a Dale Carnegie instructor and he always called every meeting for 706. Never seven o'clock, never 7.30, not even 7.10, 7.06. We asked him why. He said, because whenever you call something for seven o'clock, and yeah, seven o'clock, whenever you get 7.06, the person has in their mind by the minute. And therefore, we're going to do it since this year. It comes out to, in Toronto, Ontario, 11.59. It's much more likely that we're going to actually be able to, we're going to actually be able to remember that, 11.59, and actually make sure that we get there exactly on time. So what happens at this time until 11.59? So until 11.59, the best thing to do is really to burn the chametz. So this year that might be more challenging for some people because generally most years in most cities, and I think in Toronto we have that too, that there's a central place and most people bring in their chametz and throw it in, which this year because of the danger of congregating. So either somebody's gonna have to burn it on an individualistic level, which means that either on their barbecue grill to turn it on and high, put the chametz on top, or just by making a small fire and burning it. If that's not a possibility, then we just destruct it in any way, which could mean grinding up into small crumbs and just throwing it out in the wind in the park for the birds. Or if it's grinding it into small parts and they're just flushing it down the toilet. And the reason why it's, it's possible to do this, generally we all know we don't bring food into the bathroom and we definitely don't destroy it in such a way. However, that's because there's a concept called Bazillion Eichlin, that we don't, we don't put down Eichlin, which is essentially is our, is our life, essentially is our life, our, our life is, is, the, is the food. So therefore we shouldn't put it down. However, in this time of Pesach, being that on Pesach we are, the Torah says is that it's worthless, it's valueless, and we shouldn't do anything with it. So therefore, at this point, it actually takes on that state and we could even flush it down the toilet, which is really something that we could do in a situation where we can't burn it. So therefore, we will destruct it in other ways. And that's essentially what we'll do with our 10 pieces, any other chametz that we have, or any other chametz that was left over until this point. And then what to do about whatever is in the, in the garbage is what in pickups. And there's a lot, there's, there's a lot written about that topic. Um, I'm not going to go into that exactly. There are many that say you could just put in your garbage cans and then try to put the garbage cans outside if possible. Otherwise, and, and take ownership of very easy garbage entirely. But it's to, to, that's the general what they gave over. We can go over to that in particular and just whatever is pretty much the standard procedure for that, either putting it outside if it's possible, if garbage pickup is around then, and giving up ownership on the garbage cans, whatever's inside or keeping it outside in the possession, but entirely giving ownership of it was pretty simple, so it's valueless. So we basically cover the idea of the eating it in the morning and about the burning the chametz and to get rid of it. There's one other, sorry, there's somebody, Sorry, there are a few people that were just seeing me, they're trying to get on, but I don't know if we're able to deal with that now, unfortunately. But um, there's another big aspect this year, which is the fast of the firstborn. So what is the fast of the firstborn? So essentially, since we were in Egypt, the plague, which is the place that took place in the time eating of Pesach, the time we were sacrifice, uh, sacrifice, self sacrifice, at the time we were eating matzah, the time we were sitting at home and eating our bitter herbs, something else, and the ferns of all the Egyptians were being killed. And in a certain sense, we were saved. The firstborns were saved from that fate. And because of that, originally the firstborns were really supposed to be the high priests except that they lost it by the, the sin of the golden calf. And it came to the tribe of Levi, because the tribe of Levi 
didn't partake in the golden calf, so therefore they got instead of the firstborns. But the firstborns still have that essence, that weight on them, that really they were also supposed to be, according to what, what happened over there, they were also supposed to be killed, but God saved them. And therefore, the, the, the halacha is for, for firstborns to fast on the day prior to Pesach. So does the firstborn mean firstborn, firstborn or firstborn male? So essentially, the Mechaber in the Shulchan Aruch of Yosef Cairo, who basically congregated halacha, and, and, and which we go by. So he writes that it's firstborn males. He writes that there is an opinion, even firstborn females. And then there are Ma, or Moshe Israelis, who wrote down the law for the Ashkenazim coming from the European countries. He says that that's not our tradition and it's only males that do fast because for females it's much harder to and therefore wasn't accepted. There is a circumstance that even for females actually, the minig and, and, and the tradition is essentially to fast unless it's, unless it's too hard. The Ramah in, this, in, in Sif Beis, it's a second halacha in the topic of firstborns fasting. So the Ramah says, that if somebody has a firstborn son, which is essentially what I have, I'm not a firstborn, I have an older sister. However, I have a firstborn son. And it's interesting because I always say that he's the guy that's definitely going to have when the, when the temple's built, because there are opinions that when the final, final years, it's going to go back to the firstborns. So, you know, this is a, a, a big debate that, you know, the Kahanim are obviously going to say, no, it stays by us. And the firstborns are going to say, no, we're, you know, we get it back now that, the, you know, the final redemption came. And there's one person that can stand out, that could just go in there, not be part of the debate. This is a firstborn of a Kayan, that though he doesn't have a pity in a Ben, but he's a firstborn and he's going to, he could definitely take the red carpet right in. So I tell my son, he's the one that has the red carpet. However, if somebody has a firstborn son, he's young, he's too young to fast. So the Ramah brings down that the father fasts for him. If the father is a firstborn and therefore he's ready doing it for himself, says the Ramah that the mother does. Well, the Mishabur says right away if it's too hard not to. And the truth is, the meaning is that none of us fast. What we do, and which is the general minig of today, and there's, there's many reasons for that, specifically that someone should now, fast. That, what do we do about the fact that we normally that we have the tradition to fast? We have the halacha to fast. So what we do is we partake in a siyum. We partake in somebody who finishes a masechta. We all know what a siyum is. We just had that the siyum hashas just recently, but it doesn't have to be a siyum on shas. It could be a siyum on any track that I see behind us in the Farsal Jewish Center. We have, you know, actually in the art school, it's a lot more than just one book because it's split into many different books. When somebody finishes a masechta, when they finish. In a, 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 a larger area, Mishnah, they make a siyum, and anybody who participates in the in the siyum, since it's a suda of a mitzvah, so they can also eat on that morning. Well, this year that's going to be a little bit hard because the shuls unfortunately aren't in aren't together, and to join live would not be a possibility. The truth is is that in other years, if Shlomo Zalman, for instance, wrote that there was a circumstance that he mentioned to them to do the siyum over the phone. And in our days, it's definitely possible to do it over the phone because what's the whole idea of why we can eat? Why are we eating if we participate in the siyum? So well, from F, so the mother of a firstborn, whose husband is a firstborn, need to hear a siyum. So essentially, that would definitely, according to the way the mission brewery, he says that the tradition is many people, they are lenient of it, if anybody has a hard time fasting, not to. But essentially, according to the halacha mission brewery, they should really hear the siyam. Generally, um, just to make sure, yeah, if her husband's the firstborn and, she, and her son's the firstborn, generally there would be a little bit more of a problem. But today, as we're going to mention, that siyams are essentially this year going to be done over the phone. They're going to be done over, over Zoom. So essentially, she'll just join in also. And the reason why it definitely can be done is because today, the whole idea of why somebody can do it and why somebody can, par par and somebody can participate, if they participate, they can eat, is because they, they partook, they're part of a joy joyful occasion, a this mitzvah, a mitzvah occasion. So since they're part of it, so they essentially can, can eat, 
for the, because of the mitzvah, and then they continue eating once they broke their fast. How does anybody partake today in a in a in a this mitzvah? We're taking weddings right now because of the virus, and there's no communal ga- gathering. We partake in it over the internet, over Zoom, over phone. Unfortunately, in a funeral, which unfortunately there was a funeral today of a religious person just got fever and two days later, I mean, I don't know if it was two days later, he just didn't wake up in the morning from this virus and very extremely, extremely sad circumstance, but people participated in the funeral through the phone. So therefore, if that's the way we're participating, in, in, in joyful and mournful occasions, that is how Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Silver, if you could let in the rabbi. I don't know if anyone's the admin now, but it seems like the rabbi got disconnected. Whoever's the admin, can let him in. I'm not too, I'm not an expert, but I was just thinking, so. Okay. I don't know how I lost. Is everybody still on? Hello? Yeah. Sorry. Did, did my screen go or did everybody's screen go? It's Jeffrey Silver's fault. What? <laughs> Lauren? <laughs> Lauren, you're in quarantine. You can't talk. I don't know. It, might, it might be that my computer just lost connection to internet. It just I just got blanked out. But I'm glad we're back together. So... Essentially, this year being that, where are we up to? Where do we get lost? I think basically just this year being that, um, sorry, let me just see if there's anybody that's still, okay, there are a few people that got lost. So I'm just going to put them back in. Um, the last thing you said was about the guy that, that didn't wake up and, and the funeral was on Zoom. Yeah. So basically, since today's day and age that, Right now, everything is really essentially happening through, everything is essentially happening through Zoom, whether it's joyful, whether it's mournful. The way to participate in something is essentially through that same way, the phone and Zoom. And therefore, if somebody is connecting to it through the telephone and through the Zoom or something else with somebody making it, it's essentially that they're there and therefore they're able to, they're able to, to break their fast from being part of that CM. So essentially that would really be today. If somebody cannot hear a CM, I imagine that the Forest Hill Jewish Center will have something posted, hopefully about somebody that's gonna make one. If somebody can hear it, there are opinions that say that a person could give tzedakah instead of fasting. And tzedakah, I think Rav Hankin used to actually say that that's, 
that was his minna in general. Instead of hearing a CM, he told people to give tzedakah. And if somebody can't hear a CM for whatever reason, then they could give tzedakah instead. Another important, rea- important factor of this year is this year, Pesach falls out on a Wednesday night, Thursday. Thursday night, Friday is the second day of Pesach, and then it goes right into Shabbat. It goes right into Shabbos. Well, what does that mean? What is the difference? And the difference is, is that on Shabbos, we don't cook food. On Yom Tov, the Torah says we're allowed to cook food for whatever is needed for Yom Tov. What about what's needed for a different day? What's needed for a weekday? What's needed for Shabbos afterwards? So essentially, there's no, there's no specific, there's no specific hector, there's no specific verse in the Torah that we're allowed to cook the food. And essentially, we can't cook food from Pesach to use it for, for a weekday afterwards. We can't cook food for Pesach to use it for Shabbat afterwards. If there's leftovers, then great. You know, we're cooking it for, but as long as we're doing it for that day, it's permitted. So what do we do about a Friday before, before Shabbos? And we need our chillin, we need to put up all the food and everything that we need for Shabbos. What are we going to do? So essentially, biblically, it's okay, because since guests could come to our house, we could just say, hey, I'm cooking it for today, because maybe guests are going to show up. But the rabbinically, it didn't uh, uh, like that idea so much, because our guests can actually show up. And also, there's other problems that can come up, and therefore, they instituted something else. They instituted something called an Erev Tavshilin, that if we started preparing from before Pesach, before Yom Tov, we started preparing for Shabbat, then we're going to be allowed to continue on that initial preparation on Yom Tov to continue preparing for Shabbat, for Shabbos. So therefore, when it comes on, we can eat, possibly do it on, the, on Erev Pesach after we burn our chametz. We could possibly do it, we said 11.59, so sometime afterwards, we could do it before that. We usually take a cooked item which is, it could be a hard-boiled egg or anything else that we're going we're gonna to essentially save and not eat before Shabbos, together with, with something, a matzah, together with a baked item, because the reason why we use both of them is for anything cooked, is going to be continuation from the cooked item. Anything we're baking is a continuation from the baked item. And once we do that, there's a specific blessing that we say we can find it in, in the Siddur, the, the blessing of Erev Tafshilan. And there's a small piece that essentially we say, and that enables us to be able to cook or prepare on Friday, which is the second day of Pesach, for Shabbos the day afterwards. And this is going to be able to be done since we already started the process. And part of the reason why they necessitated the starting is because probably they were afraid that people are going to use up all the, the, the food for Yom Tov because there's just you know, so many people around. So once we started cooking ready, we started thinking about it, then we're gonna, we're gonna also save for Shabbat. And once we do that, then we're able to continue cooking afterwards. What happens if somebody forgets to make their Erev Tavshilin? So essentially the rabbis got everyone covered. The rabbi of the city is supposed to have everybody in mind, but this is not something to rely on really more than once. So therefore we should all try to make sure to do our Erev Tavshilin which is basically the, the, the start of the cooking for Shabbos, a baked item and a cooked item. And essentially that will allow us to use it for, to use it for afterwards. Is there any questions on that so far before we just get into the last, one last concept? Okay, so, hi, Adrian, and Maxine, hi. So essentially, essentially we basically covered so far the preparation of our utensils, be able to make the utensils usable in Pesto. We, we covered the idea of if somebody buys new ones, the tefillas kalim, how to immerse them in general in our times. We covered the, the betikas chametz, which is essentially why we use the flashlight for preparing the 10 pieces. Um, just, just basically going over things to make sure that everything was, 
was taken care of in advance. We covered the we covered the time to eat until and about burning the hummus, which essentially today we don't really have these big, we're not really gonna get together for the big burnings and therefore somebody can do it on the grill or a smaller thing, it's best to do it like that. Otherwise somebody can get rid of it in any way possible before 11.59, which is in Toronto, the end of the burning time if somebody can't do it that way to just get rid of it anyway, flush it down the toilet however it's possible. Um, and then we covered what to do for a Bechar in today's, in today's day in general, the fact that we participate in the Suda of a mitzvah like a Siyam, and today that it's not possible in a person to do that over, over Zoom, phone, whatever else is possible. And one other very pertinent halacha, which is going to lead us into next week's session, which next week's session is going to be the halachas of the Seder in itself. And one other halacha that reflects on the whole joy that we have to the mitzvahs of Pesach is the minhag or the halacha not to eat matzah or something that's going to be used later for the mitzvah on Erev Pesach. Some people, not only do they not eat an Erev Pesach, but we refrain, which right now is Rosh Chedesh Nisan. And there are many people that have a minhag not to eat matzah from Rosh Chedesh Nisan until Pesach. And why? The reason is, is because matzah is a mitzvah. And we want to enjoy that matzah. We want it to be tasteful to the, pal to, to the palate. We want it to be enjoyful. And therefore, we want it to be that when we, we have it for the first time, Pesach night, we eat it with the first time, that freshness and enjoyment. And therefore, we refrain from eating that matzah, definitely an Arab Pesach. And many people don't even do it from Rosh Chodesh Nisan, which is essentially tonight. Because the main idea of Pesach and the main idea in general of mitzvahs is the more that we enjoy, the more that we enjoy the mitzvah, the more we could connect over that mitzvah. And it's for that reason that many times when somebody wants to connect with somebody, we go out to eat in a restaurant. And the reason is, is because when somebody is sitting with, uh, when somebody is sitting with food in front of them and they're eating that steak or it could be Brussels sprouts, whatever somebody enjoys, or that's that's what they're that's what they 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 like to eat. It makes the entire interaction more joyful, and even though it's even though it's external circumstances, but it makes the connection a deeper connection because they remember them in their mind a connection that was a connection that was joyful, and therefore we try as much as we can to have the mitzvahs in a joyful way. Pesach night is the time of Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs. It's essentially the time that we can most connect. We could go from imagining ourselves in Egypt to becoming the chosen nation of God and all the challenges and it's been in this time and knowing that he was there with us through all the times in the past and he'll be with us now and every time in the future. And we connect with him in a way of positivity, of joy, of enjoying the Seder, enjoying the mitzvah, that's really what can actually bring us more, that concept of what we know together with that feeling of, of enjoyment. And that's why we also, we'll talk about it more next week. We take out our nicest utensils on Pesach. We, we put a nice decor on the table. And even though there's, there might be a plus this year, if somebody doesn't have utensils ready to use disposable, not to have to get into the immersing the, the utensils question, but essentially we set it up nice because we want it to be a joyful time. And through that joyful time, we'll be able to connect on an ultimate level. So we'll see everybody if just before we actually disclose if there's anybody that has any last questions on Erev Pesach or before that, next week we'll cover the, the Seder itself. Does anybody have any more questions? At this point, anybody can either type in or we don't need to be on mute anymore. So if anybody wants to be on mute, and if not, then we'll see everybody next week. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Take care. Thank you, Rabbi.